welcome to another episode of Panel on Panels, the podcast about all things comics and comics related. I'm your host, John Campbell. Joining me as always, Mike Gergoni. Greetings. And Mr. Donovan Eilert. Hi, everybody. And we are coming to you uh, from the floor of Rose City Comic Con, right as things are uh, breaking up on day one. And we are very excited to be sitting here uh, at a table with Jamie S. Rich. Howdy. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> long day? Uh, yeah, it's been a good day. It has yeah. been a long one, though. Cool. Uh, yeah, I hit the had a panel that, that you guys saw at yep. the very beginning of the day, and yep. then I've been at the table the whole time since. I left once to go to the bathroom. Wow, <laughs> that's a long, long yeah. day. That Far is some shorter, fortitude. Though. Yes, <laughs> and it sold about half, more than half of the books we brought. So, well, that's cool. Very happy. Yeah, and uh, you've been pri- were you primarily here with uh, Lady Killer? Obviously, that was what the panel was yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Lady Killer is the newest thing, um, and I've discovered for me, like I do better at conventions if I don't bring all my books. So okay. I just <laughs> brought the more recent stuff. So like uh, Lady Killer, Aries and Aphrodite, and Madame Frankenstein. Uh, I find like if you have ten book different titles on the table. It just makes people go like, I don't know which one, so I won't buy any. <laughs> Not to mention the whole like lifting ten yeah. copies yeah. of everything into the con. And so since I started doing that, like I go home with a lot less. <laughs> so that's good. So yeah, that is less good. back problems after the yeah. day is done. So uh, being that we are a comic book co- podcast, we're always sort of interested in people's origin stories. And uh, one of the first questions we like to ask is sort of, did you remember what the first kind of comic? was that really clicked you into the medium? Um, I had had a few, like Donald Duck and that kind of thing that were around the house, but the first one I went out and bought actively, um, and the first time I even went in a comic book shop, which was actually just like the back room of some guy, it was <laughs> his dad's real estate agency. Of course. Wow. Uh, and it was G.I. Joe number two, the Marvel nice. one, which then amusingly turned out to be the really rare one. Huh. But I, by the time I found that out, I'd already filled out. I was ten, and so I'd already filled out the uh, fan form on the back, and it was all beat up. Oh, it's personalized yeah. now, isn't yeah. that? That's got to be make it hike it up the worth. Uh, and that's began. I think the next thing I bought was like a Spider Man, and like the whole habit then grew out of there. Sure. Yeah. And then that just continued. Through yeah, the- I mean, it was in the the '80s was a really good time to be reading comics because it's comparable to now, to where there was such an explosion of creator own books and individual books and so Love and Rockets and for me Grendel by Matt Wagner is a big deal and so it's like hot wired in my DNA that uh, of that you would that's the two sides of comics. There's the indies and there's the mainstream and both can exist together. And so it's kind of amusing for me now that creator owned is a marketing term. Right. Because I'm just like, you know, where have you guys been? I've been here for years. <laughs> Do you still have that G.I. Joe number two? No. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if that was... Uh, it's always, no. It was fun. And so uh, then at what age did it sort of become, uh, I want to do this, I want to work in comics? Um, I, was not, I was already interested in writing, and I thought at the time I thought I was going to be a, a Walt Disney-style cartoonist. Oh, oh like yeah. Thank you, voice of God. <laughs> Um, I had certain ambience to the podcast. And so, so now I, at the time, I thought I was going to be like a Walt Disney style cartoonist, and I had a, I had whole plans for like this multimedia. I was going to do like the Chronicles of Narnia style books, but then there'd be the animated movies, and this was all the stuff that I was just making up in my backyard as role playing by myself. And so I started once I got into comics, I started trying to draw them and thought about add, and then was adding them into this plan I had. And, Somewhere around junior high, I realized I couldn't draw. Mm. And so, and, but I, my thing that I really liked doing was the storytelling, so I focused on that. And so I started pitching to Marvel and DC. I think my first convention, I was 13 or 14. I wow. took a pitch and talked to Joe Duffy with a one-page pitch. And really? He gave me all these pointers, yeah. Very cool. Uh, and so that, so comics was never the only thing I was going to do. I was Novels were sort of my main focus, but there's always going to be some kind of comics element in there. Yeah. I feel like that just can't really happen anymore today. There's just so many people, like, trying to pitch for that thing, especially at cons. Oh, yeah. Like, it's so tough to, like, get that. Just like, here, would you please read my thing? Right. Writing especially yeah. always drives me crazy. Yeah. Because with art, you can just look at it. Yes. Writing is, please read this page of the thing I wrote. Yeah. And then you're trying them. It's all the noise and the chaos to, like, right. the process. And, no, it's crazy. And, I mean, I'm not a big fan of the verbal pitch because it's like, well, I need to know you have to put something on paper. So, right. so you're going to have to follow up that good idea with something uh, important if you showing me that you can do the work. So, yeah, it was a completely charmed experience. I mean, I 
I then became a letter hack and was writing letters to comics, and that's how I met Dinah Schutz and Bob Shrek and Matt Wagner. I was at a San Diego Comic Con in 1987 when you could walk up to somebody and they and talk to them and then see them again the next year and they would remember you mm-hmm. that small and right. so it's, <laughs> yeah it's impossible to imagine now right exactly uh, and so was then was that where those connections are your foot in the door the yeah. Dinah Schutz Bob Shrek yeah because I walked up and I and I said you know I I written I think it was a Justice Machine comic and I said you know I written I've had a letter printed in, uh, in this and Diana said, oh, yeah, what's your name? And I said, Jamie Rich. And she said, of Quartz Hill, California. And, like, yeah. <laughs> and my mind just, like, exploded. And, and so it was. that, And that was how she had kind of broken into comics, was writing letters and working retail. And and so I was in college, and she said, you know, when you graduate, give me a call. Wow. And that's I became her assistant at Dark Horse in 94. This is, this is inc- consistently every guest we've had on this podcast. Like the foot in the door is Dinah Schutz. Uh, yeah, she's brought in a lot of people. It's it's just incredible. Like it, 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 without fail. It, yeah, every just, single time at some point somebody mentions Diana Schutz and we go, of course she did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, which is why she's going to be the get for this podcast. At some point. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, walking around earlier, so keep your eye out. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, so, what was that first? What was your first gig then? As a, I was a, an editorial assistant. Diana was uh, editor in chief at the time. Okay. And so 1994, Dark Horse. And what uh, kind of stuff were you doing as an editorial assistant? A lot of ske- a lot of working on her schedule, a lot of photocopying, mm-hmm. a lot of just you know, sort of keeping keeping her running. Uh, because it was editor in chief, there was a lot more of like scheduling the meetings and knowing that. And, uh, but then also the books she was editing, then I was seeing the process and being put in on that and, and watching how the it was all made. Cool. Are there specific things you remember from that of lessons of like, wow, this is something you wouldn't learn in a class about comics or, you know, any other way? Yeah, I mean, well, learning how the coloring worked at the time, which is vastly different, pre-digital. Sure. Um, just that whole, yeah, process of like, here's how the pieces get together and here's the order it happens and how long it happens and, and things that you would never notice in that are wrong in comics once you learn that oh, you're supposed to look for those as an editor. Hmm. I mean, at the time I, when inking was on the board, I remember having to circle for her where, when the inker would go into the word balloon mm-hmm. and the lettering. Oh, interesting. The and then suddenly I saw that in every comic. Like, <laughs> like, Nobody erased that. Uh, it's a little bit of just like, you're seeing how the sausage is made, so now you can't unsee yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then after that, I was Bob Shrek's assistant. So it was like, I always say, working for Diana was learning the letter of the law. She was very exact, and this is how things are done. And working mm-hmm. for Bob Shrek was learning the spirit of the law, which is like, fuck it, let's make some comics. <laughs> cool. I assume I can swear on this podcast. Absolutely, yeah, that's yeah, fine. yeah no yeah. problem. Uh, I just did. <laughs> we, we do it all the goddamn time. All right. Um, so, uh, so then it seemed like you were kind of on a, a track to be an editor then. Yeah, I always was, I was working on my first novel at the time, cut my hair, but there was that long period of not working on it. And, um, <laughs> so when I left Dark Horse for Oni, that was the main goal was to finally sort of put that into shape, and so that came out in two thousand. Uh, so it it the track I always and yeah I never expected to actually be an editor that long. I always like I'll jump off when I have this thing done and then I'm published and I'm famous and. Right. So, and then you turn around and you're like, oh, God, six years have passed and I've edited hundreds of comics. And yeah. Uh, but you were continuing to write through that whole time? As... Yeah, I was working on my prose. Uh, and then it was when I left Oni in uh, 2004 that I was going to focus. That I actually started writing comics as well. And that's when 12 Reasons Why I Love Her was like the first thing. That was the first thing? Yeah. And then obviously that was the first time then you worked with Joel Jones. Yes. Who, who, and who, that, that partnership has been... Yeah, and, uh, and who I was introduced to by Diana Schutz. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> she did mention that because we had Joelle on the show, and that yeah. was one of the, the connections there. It turned out we lived like, like two blocks apart, like literally right, two blocks yeah, apart. That's so awesome. On the same street. And, uh, um, a little bit off the topic of comics, but edit, or maybe not, editing comics, did that teach you anything that you brought back into your prose work? Um, I mean, general storytelling. Sure. Is, like, like how stories work, the way structure works, uh, that kind of stuff. And. It, at the time, I, mean, I was writing my second novel, Everlasting, at the same time I was writing 12 Reasons Why I Love Her, and like, I was exercising different parts of my brain. So they did definitely serve different functions, but I think maybe Everlasting wouldn't be a good example because it's very long, but I think eventually like maybe 
learning to pare things down in comic scripts also then got me to pare things down in prose as well. Hmm. Cool. And do you find writing the two, like, do work separate parts of the brain? Yeah. Hmm. And because at the time I would be like, I'd get stuck in the everlasting and wouldn't know what to do next. And so I'd write like a chapter of 12 Reasons Why I Love Her. And, hmm. Interesting. And it would be like a coffee break. It was way easier. Huh. <laughs> and then something I'm always fascinated by in comic book writing because people, there doesn't seem to be a specific approach to writing a comic script. Sort of like screenplays have a certain look, yeah. basically. What do your scripts look like? There's a couple now. There's a couple basic approaches. Like you might get a, a word template or I use the final draft template that mm-hmm. Anthony Johnston created. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it kind of looks like a screenplay because it is final draft, but it changes all the exterior scenes. I'd say it's a panel one, page one, all right. that stuff. So it looks like a kinda looks like a screenplay. Yeah, with centered dialogue, all of that. Uh-huh. And are you? I mean, how much detail do you go into, and in what things should look like, or how much it to really, give to your artist? It really varies. Like I try not to call out shots and angles and. Um, I will describe, you know, what I, th- I think is essential to see, uh, but it varies. Like if I'm writing a script and I don't know who's going to eventually draw it, I'm going to be way more detailed. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I've worked with you three times, I know exactly what I can tell you. So like with writing for Joelle would be just like so succinct at this point because uh, I know what she would do and I know what she doesn't want me to, to get into. <laughs> and I feel like being an an overbearing writer or a loquacious writer in comic scripts just sort of obfuscates what really needs to happen in those panels. If your artist has to dig through all this little, like all this prose to figure out this is the moment, uh, you're kind of just missing the point. They don't want to read your short story. Exactly. <laughs> and they also don't want you to be like, this is a, a calling out, is like reverse angle and close up and I only do that when I have a very specific moment that I think this will work, and I can see it clearly in my mind. And I see every page in my mind, so I I can I write what I see, but <laughs> I leave out those details unless like I think I have something here that will be really interesting. And I but then even there, like unless you have a better idea, right? And because uh, I think that's the the core of collaboration. Absolutely. So, so when Joe Wall was on the show, she said that you're a pretty big cinephile, that you love yeah. movies and the visual aesthetic and film noir, obviously. Uh, we haven't talked about this yet, but uh, you have killed me, you yeah. know, being in that, that style. Um, do you ever feel tempted to kind of go into that? I mean, with, with lighting and, I mean, even more than, you said you don't really, but do you ever right. have the urge to, like, really just let go into that? And the shadows fell across her face as... Sometimes. I mean, in You Have Killed Me, there was definitely, like thinking about lighting sources and i mean there's in the climax there's when the lights are out yeah Mm -hmm. and even i think it i'm not sure if it is in the script i think it even says in the script unless this is really cheesy (laughs) um let's do this but so if yeah if there's a reason why i think this particular panel has to have a shadow go a certain way but it's also not my skill set sure and technically if you're writing a screenplay you're not really supposed to do that either right the director's gonna want to do that yeah so um, I tr- but I try to I think I have a lot of movement in my comics and I think it's because of the cinema where I'm thinking about the movement between the panels and, yeah um, I have a graphic novel that never got drawn that like at the time I had I was trying to do like a Jean-Luc Godard one car Y sort of thing cool. and trying to figure out how to do that in comics yeah and, and there was a lot of like moving around getting on elevators getting off elevators mm-hmm. and as transition and <coughs> And I remember at that time we had some literary agents that read it, and they're like, "That's the thing they noticed was there's so much like flowing between the pages." Yeah, right. And then I was gonna say, I mean, being such a cinephile and and writing the stuff, have you ever been tempted to write a movie? I have, and I've got a screenplay called The Dog Sitter that didn't end up going anywhere. I showed it around to some people, got some notes. Mm-hmm. And then tried to get clarification. <laughs> Those notes. Oh, that's, yeah, that's never going to go well. <laughs> well, it was someone that I, that I was supposed to be working with, and they, and they, they their, their main note was that, like this movie needs to decide whether it's a, a mainstream romantic comedy or if it's a small indie. Ugh. Yeah. And I was like, well, this is the sort of stuff I'm looking at. I think it was Morning Glory at the time, the Rachel McAdams movie, and I'm. Mm-hmm. Like, and I was kind of like looking at that. Why? Where's the distinction? Is it? Is it ca- for me? It seemed like casting would be the distinction. Of right. Like, you cast bigger. This will be a bigger movie. But either way, it's like should it be easy to shoot. It was too long. I knew that, but I couldn't get any more clarification after that. Sure. 
Uh, so I want I want to talk about your uh, real, uh, working relationship with with Joel because we had her on the show obviously. Right. And uh, how quickly did that sort of did you two click on like twelve reasons why I love her? Day one was it? It was it was sort of an instant like this is we this met is. yeah we met in a coffee shop um, and it turned out that like our paths had crossed. We didn't know it. I had signed her up at the video store that I worked at. Oh wow! <laughs> and, uh, and she'd been drawing at uh, Vivace, and I had a friend that worked there who was like, "You need to go to the video store and talk to this guy, Jamie." And she was just like, well, "Yeah, whatever, you creep." <laughs> um, and so we had no idea about that. And so when we met at the coffee shop, it was kind of this nervous. I I'm, I hadn't actually seen her art, so I was like, "Diana said she's good, so I hope that she really is." Mm-hmm. And then I hope she likes my script. And then we spent the entire day hanging out and talking. I don't know if we did karaoke that night or <laughs> that night, but we basically spent the entire day just hanging out together. And I basically walked away and said, well, I have a deal with Oni Press for this book. Um, if you like this script and they don't like you, then I will break my contract. Wow. And, because you're going to draw this book. Dang. And thankfully they were smart enough to go, yeah, she's really good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and that's coming out in hardcover yeah, in the so near future. It, yeah, because it, it came out in 2006, so over the 10th anniversary. Cool. It's been out of print for a little bit, and so we're going to do a, a bigger, hard co- oversized hardcover. I guess oversized for it. I don't know if it's going to be like oversized, like the, yeah. an absolute edition. Or it, it will not fit on your shelf. Yeah, See, I, gonna, don't, I don't know about that. Like, <laughs> it's going to be more like You've Killed Me size, but since 12 Reasons was actually smaller. Okay. Yeah. Really. The French edition is what we're mimicking because the French did it that size and it looked amazing, hmm. which it shouldn't because Joelle drew it at repro size. She didn't know you drew bigger. Right. So that's like, I think, 6 by 9 or something. She drew it at 6 by 9 and. And so you would have expected that as it blew up that the details would break apart because you shrink and they get tighter. Right. So we were very happy to see that. Hmm, yeah. that Interesting. Happen, so. Is it just, like, because of her style it ended up working out? No or, or some <laughs> computer did, wizard was I like, enhance. French are good at it because I've seen <laughs> them do it with some other books, too. Um, hmm. And then there'll be there's actually going to be some script pages in the back of that to show people how the scripts look and uh, because they were, it, it was a very exact structure, and, and the script sort of just kind of happened and flowed, and and uh, so I, I we wanted to give a little extra sneak peek for people who hadn't had seen it yet or had seen it before mm-hmm. and wanted a reason to get the new book. Cool. cool. And all of the the chapters of that start off with a song reference right. or a movie reference. How did you how do you pick those? Um, just very naturally. That sort of stuff's super easy for me. Okay. Uh, and so, I mean, in reality, I think they're going to, they're actually going to print the one page pitch that I did, which is the sparsest, most unbelievable, like, can't believe they bought this. Pitch. <laughs> but I had, from the day I caught and came up with the idea, I sat down and I had the, okay, it's going to be 12 parts and it's going to be out of chronological order. And you'll probably see like a, the, a resolution of a fight before you see the fight. And then I wrote 1 through 12, and I filled in about half of them, mm-hmm. and including, like, the joke. Here's a page where she just tells a joke. Uh, and it's pretty much stayed that way right up until the end. And it was very easy to write because then I just had to write one of them at a time. And yeah. So it, the song references, I don't remember what exactly made me start them. I was kind of doing a, I loved when they did that in Love and Rockets. And yeah. mm-hmm. we always did that when I was editing Blue Monday. China would always put in songs, so basically just built the soundtrack that i wanted cool i think it really adds to the the realism and relatability of that i mean uh, relationships built through shared interests of pop culture and things like that too. yeah and, it, and there is the chapter where they argue over records that, yeah that i wanted to that kind of connection to yeah sure yeah cool. and did that comic come out of i mean without you don't have to get into any detail but did that come out of an autobiographical place at all there's a couple of spots in there sure because there I mean, are things that actually happen but there's always twisted like there's the movie the exorcist scene was a different movie okay yeah where i fell asleep and my girlfriend was freaked out and, sure um, and actually that chapter the the whole not actually arguing over the records but the joke marriage proposal that mm-hmm. that, that 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 kind of thing where certain kernels you find sure and and add into it but i tend not to go straight forward with auto right because yeah, I mean, I just say, like it, it, it just it, it felt very realistic and, and 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 yeah, universal in that kind yeah. of sense. So I figured, you know, exactly there had to be um, pieces. And then so then did you moving from that that obviously did well enough to get you more writing gigs. Yeah, I mean, it. it I always knew that was book was going to be special. I could just feel it, mm-hmm. and particularly once Joel came on. And so it did make a pretty good impact, and, and particularly for her and I, it was something that we knew was going to get us green. And that's how You've Killed Me 
happened. Uh, I knew I, I knew she was still drawing the book, and no one had seen it yet. Mm-hmm. And I knew that the moment she saw it, like all the other indie writers would be crawling out of their woodwork <laughs> to try to steal her. And that's how I was like, "What do you want to do next?" And she said, "I want to do something that's like film noir, pulp fiction." And so I was like, "All right." And I was terrified of it. Yeah, because I loved it so much. I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah, uh, and but I was like, I'm going to take this challenge, and it pretty came together pretty quickly after that too. So you have killed me. Obviously, is heavily inspired by film specifically. Yeah, uh, were there specific movies? I mean, I, I think I can see certain things in there. Yeah, I mean, the, the actual hear. like log line when I pitched it was uh, Michelangelo Antonioni directing The Big Sleep. Oh, that's uh, so. I wanted awesome. something like Love and really awesome. Yeah, where it was sort of dreamy <laughs> and and different and. Uh, the funny thing is, is I was the one that watched all the movies, and Joel read all the like the Chandler novels and stuff. So yeah, I had all the visual that. reference, and she was more into the <laughs> words. Uh, and so, but that was the thing is, I I had sort of pigeonholed my and for her too. She's like, you you pigeonhole yourself as this romance writer, and you can do these other things. And it was kind of just finding my way into that book, which was the narration turned out to be the thing because mm. I didn't want to do that. You know, it was a dark night, and she was the kind of dame that a guy would, you know, sure, I just, sure. like, I can't do that. Everybody does that. Sure. And, and once I locked into his point of view, it was, like, that. that's when I learned I can do genre, and I can make it myself. <laughs> yeah. And I can try on these different hats. And, well, I mean, and noir has so much, I mean, you talk about being a romance writer. There is some, a, a very twisted romantic yeah. sense to it as yeah. well. Um, how did that pitch go over, by the way, the Antonioni directing... Uh, uh, Joe, big, Joe big, knows Mag at Oni was like that's that's fine I get it but if you ever like walk into a, a, a movie studio and you say that don't do it because <laughs> <Right. laughs> right, just as you said that like me the the film student is like oh that's yeah. so awesome no, but I like, can imagine other people being like what yeah pick successful <laughs> movies that are new <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, with uh, you have killed me then um, that you said that came together pretty quickly. The pitch itself, the book took a little longer. Joel got a gig uh, with Minx. She did uh, this book mm-hmm. called Token. Token, yeah. yeah. That sort of got in the way for a bit. And then, so I think we were like, I think we were solicited. And then the year later, we came, we were resolicited and came out. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was 2009, I think. So we debuted at San Diego Comic Con. And, and that book took off for even faster. Than uh, twelve reasons why I love her. Yeah, I mean that's definitely when when I be, when I became aware of you guys uh, through that book, and I think a lot of people uh, did as well. Was there then from that? Was it like okay, this is a this is a partnership. We should. What are we going to do next? Or uh, I was pushing for more, and and we were already pitching spell checkers around. But I knew, like I my kind of feeling was like she shouldn't really draw all of that because. I was working on another graphic novel for us, and I was like, that's going to be bigger, and I'd rather have you work on that serious thing. Um, and then, but at the same time, I think understandably, she wanted to sort of dabble elsewhere as well and, and work with other writers and just see what that was like. And and to be fair, I, it was much easier for me to get other artists and do more books than it is for an <laughs> artist to do more books. So, so that naturally made things sort of, sit on the back burner for a while mm-hmm. and, and I, I wrote a couple of things for her that we just that just never sort of came to fruition and, um for no fault of our own mm-hmm. i think if someone had pushed us to do those certain things i've i've told her and she doesn't ha- they never quite saw it i always felt like right from the get-go it felt like people we were working with that were supposed to have our best interests always seemed to be separating us hmm. we had agents that kept giving her uh, trying to get her other gigs and i'm like what about the book we're doing together <laughs> right yeah. um and you know and then other publishers hiring her like only p- trying to put on putting her on hellheim eventually I, I don't know it was always weird like i feel like why don't you guys know <laughs> that because uh oni's marketing director for was like said we were the only brand uh cory Cursoni said we were the only brand that was creator based and not book based that he's like i can sell anything with that you two do together. <laughs> right because i think i think for fans that's a big deal like i mean li- like when i see the two of your names i'm like oh that's going to be something yeah. special in the same way that when i saw when i see Loeb and sale on something yeah. like this idea that you're linked and because we way. bring things out of each other and part of it for me is and i think even for her in the early stages we, we want to impress each other so I got to do a script that's going to So there's some there. upsmanship going on yeah. between the two of you. Yeah, I want and, and for me, I always felt she was way more talented than I was. So <laughs> I have to really raise my game to deserve this artwork. <laughs> uh, I've always said she's like the m- one most talented people I met from the get-go. Like the most yeah. raw talent. And I think that's 
been proven out. Absolutely. Oh, for sure. Uh, you brought up Spell Checkers, uh, which was more of an ongoing series. Yeah, it was intended to be... Well, I would have kept writing it, but we sort of made a deal for let's do three mm-hmm. and see how the three do, and which is kind of your rule of thumb. If it's going to be an ongoing series of graphic novels, the, 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 tri- the first trilogy has to be really successful or you stop there. So I wrote that specifically in mind of like, well, if these are the only three we get, then it'll be complete. And so... And so there wasn't much warrant. People liked it, but the, yeah, sales wise, there wasn't a huge demand for us to do more. Uh, one day I would like to. I had a whole fourth idea that I cool. really wanted to get into, and I had a finale that one day I wanted to do. <laughs> so I was like, "There's it's always possible." I enjoyed writing it because it was largely like me having insult fights with myself. Is like <laughs> how I wrote that book. It's a super fun book. I really enjoyed. it. You heard him, Internet. We need to continue spell checkers. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> let's get that out there now. Uh, <laughs> Um, so from there, what, what, what did you sort of move on to? Um, you know, I, it was weird because I was I occasionally pitched around to other places and like tried to break into the mainstream comics and just never quite just never fit, never made sense. Uh, so I think largely like I started then looking for other collaborators. So stuff like a boy and a girl with Natalie Norgat, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And then there was the year he did. Uh, I was doing it, girl in the Atomics, which was super fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and trying to, and then Megan finding Megan Levins was like another collaborator that I was could do a lot of stuff with, and that we we meshed in such a way that like like Aries and Aphrodite. We always tell people, which was true, is we didn't. What she didn't realize is I was trying to write the male character to make her fall in love with him, mm. and she was trying to draw the lady to make me fall in love with her, <laughs> and it totally worked. <laughs> like, and when I find when I told her that's what I had been doing, because we were trading script and art like on a daily basis. Like, I, I'd be like, okay, this is what I did today, and she'd send me here's what I oh, did dang. today, and so yeah, it, but it really worked. Was like we wanted to we wanted we wanted those characters to be so charming. Sure. Uh, so it's that same though kind of one of some ship. I want to impress that person. Mm-hmm. But that was how that rolled. <laughs> like, it's it's to love so him. nice to hear about collaborations like that as opposed to yeah. And I got the script. I never met the guy. Yeah, yeah. I never <laughs> wanted to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was a point where someone else was going to draw Twelve Reasons Why I Love Her, and that person had quit after a year of hmm. not working uh, when she was supposed to start working on it. And, and there was a fear that it was going to become one of those anonymous things Oof. where only will find an artist that will just do it. And and luckily, James Lucas Jones was adamant. Because there was even a point where I was like, let's, I had a list. Like, let's hire these 12 artists to do an individual chapter. Ah. And they'll all be different. He mm-hmm. was like, no, that's a bad way to do your first graphic novel. You want, <laughs> right. it, to be, you want it to be solid and a, co- a cohesive book. And, and we'll find someone. And so, yeah, it, it they stuck with it. And, uh you mentioned uh, the, uh, trying your hand or looking into doing more mainstream stuff. Did you? I mean, do you or do you now even still have any desire to do something like like? Do you have a Batman story in you or something? That's. I think that's always been the problem. Is I never had those stories in me. Huh, right. And most editors on that side of things will ask you like, "What do you want to do? What's the character you want?" And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and I'm very practical because I've been an editor. It's like I my was like, "What do you need?" Right. Tell me which character you need, and I'll pitch you that character. And so, no, there's not. I would do it if an opportunity came along that I thought was interesting. But uh, and and I have done both work for Marvel and DC. The DC stuff never came out. The Marvel was just a short story. Uh, but yeah, there's not. I'm not dying to tell my one good Batman story. I just right. don't have it. Because I mean, I could see somebody reading like you have killed me and being like, oh. You know, like a Batman, the, nor- yeah. the narration and stuff like that, and, th- and wanting to fit you into that. But. Yeah, I thought maybe It Girl, I could flow out of that, and I did do some pitches. Um, I started pitching to DC at that point, and that was right when the New 52 started. So I was like, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, yeah, yeah. The editor I knew, he was like, "There's yeah, like right now is not the time <laughs> to, to come in because like, we've got a plan. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Um, so now you have now you are working as an editor. Yes, I'm, I'm a senior editor at Vertigo Comics. Um, so was that a, a, a did you make that like was that a conscious decision to go? I'm going to go more into editing now. Uh, no, I got a phone call. The blue. And they were just like, we want was, you to. And uh, as Shelley Bond says, she thought I would never say yes, and it just was kind of such a bizarre <laughs> surprise. That, like I got it. I got it. I actually immediately went to Joel and was like, well, "What do I do?" And she's like, "You got to at least see what happens. Yeah, <laughs> um, at least take the yeah, take the interview." And you, and I had to be reminded. Uh, it was Sarah Hahn, who's now at Boom, was the one that reminded me like, "You can say no. You can get offered a job <laughs> and go like, never mind.'" 
Yeah. Um, so, so I did. I, and then it became a thing. It came in the thing I didn't believe I wanted to, like, the thing, like, I got it. If, like, when I was waiting to find out, like, I better get this. Right. <laughs> yeah, because there's always that sense, especially when you're, like, coming up from a fan status into, like, this industry. And you're being like, so they offered me a job. I have to take it, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. But like, you've got yeah. to a point where it's like, I don't have to say yeah. yes. I just hate wasting people's time. So right. like, if I don't think I want it, I shouldn't take it. And I actually once was kind of up for a job at Viz, and mm. I did that. And I was stupid because they were going to fly me to San Francisco for an interview. And I like, I could have gotten a free trip to San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, I don't like wasting people's time or if I don't think I'm really going to follow through. Uh, so that was kind of where I was coming from, but yeah, very I also, noble of you. I also though always tell younger creators that are getting into it, you've it's it's one thing to know an opportunity knocks, and it's also no not to answer that door because <laughs> you will get offered jobs. You're like, I am completely wrong for this. I don't think I want to work with that person, and you should probably some listen to your instincts at those times and <laughs> get out because if it's going to be or it might be hell for you forever, however long. Right. Um, so I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up uh, Lady Killer, um, which is an amazing piece of work. Uh, Thank you. Is uh, this was Joelle's idea? Yes. Um, and so she did she come to you with it? Or? Yeah, we were out at the movies, and we there's a that the there's a local theater, the Living Room Theaters in Portland, Absolutely. That has a bar. And so we were waiting <laughs> to go into the movie, and we we're drinking, and she's like, "I got an idea," and I think she was kind of scared to tell me because that I would say it was stupid or something, and. And she told me, you know, 1950s housewife, and she's secretly a government, or secretly an assassin. There was a time where it was probably somehow more, like, we had different backstories for what that would be. And, but that was the core idea right there. And, and I immediately was like, that sounds fantastic. We should do that. Um, and so, from, and, and I couldn't stop thinking about it afterwards either. And so I surprised her because I think it was, like, the next day I went home and I typed up, here's all the things we talked about. <laughs> and here's some other ideas and sh that's when she knew oh he he wasn't just kidding it's he one thing to talk about man. a thing and it's another yeah. thing to see it on a page or maybe he's being nice and he's like oh that sounds great we should mm -hmm. totally do that and it's never gonna happen right uh, and so yeah it came flowing right out of that and um and we really we did a lot of development time and tra trading references and like you should see this movie you should see this book mm -hmm. and and working out different stories and and so, yeah, it was pretty. It was a pretty fun process of development. So even though by the time we finally did it, she did like eighty percent of the actual writing, like all of that development time went into collaborative world yeah, building, like yeah. spending a time to really flesh out even the stuff that like nobody's ever going to read and right. stuff. But those little details that because the creator has it in their back of their yeah. brain, or the stuff we changed our minds on, right. we now know that's not the thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it. It was an interesting process, to, but I, the joke has been I was like John Byrne on Hellboy. Like, yeah. Like, I, like, you don't really need me here. You just think you do. <laughs> I mean, was there a specific point in that process where, where it was like, fly, you Joel, fly. On this? My issue four or five, um, I, could, I was doing so little of rewriting dialogue. And, and we had worked out a lot of the story in person. Or she, she would talk through it with me, and I would, it would give input if needed. But, yeah, why that last script was like, I'm getting paid for this. Like, <laughs> and I always kind of knew that by, issue, by it, that it would wasn't that long off that she would uh, eventually, like, just take over the whole thing. So the move to Vertigo, I think, just pushed it ahead a little bit. Because now she's continuing it on with a, a new volume of stories. Uh, yeah. Without, I mean, do you have any involvement in that? or Only in the you know, sense that we're friends and she'll... she'll be like this is what i'm gonna do with it and i'm like that's cool <laughs> yeah. and or maybe you should do that but yeah not not in any official or heavy duty capacity yeah um, i mean that's cool so i mean it, that's got to be pretty exciting for you to see joelle really uh, yeah i think take off in this i way. mean i've already seen how it's blossomed made her blossom and really come together for her and so i think it's I'd always thought it was going to be like by the third series, so it is just like one early. But I think she's there's, I have zero <laughs> she left doubt. too soon. <laughs> yeah, I have zero doubt that. I mean, it's going to be a lot of how why that book is good was me staying out of the way at times. So I think now that I'm completely out of the way, it'll be even better. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then do you, now that now that you're editing, do you still? have desire to write comics as well or do you still have plans to uh, write more i think stuff? i might revisit prose a little bit oh cool for a while uh, i mean yeah because there's definite 
sort of I mean for now I need to sort of get my feet grounded in the new gig it's only been like six months so mm-hmm. but yeah eventually there's, I'm going to have some kind of creative outlet for myself somewhere whether it's something you won't see for several years or <laughs> it's just yeah something I do for myself it's just what, you know that's what I'll end up figuring out I might go back to that screenplay I don't know well that'd be cool yeah. I mean is that still something do you still have desire to, to yeah. make movies yeah uh, I, I still have a desire to do that story, yeah. There's one point where we, uh, Nico, Nicholas Satori Day, the artist on Spell Checkers, was wanting to pitch stuff in France, and and I actually rewrote the pitch for it to be in France, uh, and sort of tried to actually wrote a new outline try, just from memory, based on the screenplay, so that I would always, <laughs> I still have the screenplay as its own thing. Um, so yeah, it's a story that I really like, and and that I think I would try to do again at some point, but. And I know at the at the Lady Killer panel earlier today, you mentioned that there's been some interest from people on turning Lady Killer into yeah. Movies, I mean, something. there's def- there's been some talk, but nothing that's even remotely concrete. Um, sure. Producers just saying, yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, I mean, we work we're working with Dark Horse Entertainment on that kind of stuff, so they've pitched like these are some people we would like involved, and yeah. and so those that's but nothing. Yeah, like. I mean, it's, I mean, I think it's certainly. I mean, a lot of your stuff. I mean, I think comes from your love of movie. It yeah. feels very cinematic in nature. I mean that that, but that whole process is like mysterious and slow and ephemeral. <laughs> right. And, right. Yeah. and you know, you're everything's great up until the second it just stops. <laughs> right. Know? Exactly. So, yeah. So yeah. So I said at the panel, like, unless there's a check in my hand and cameras are rolling, like it ain't real. So. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, but, it's, but would you? Is that something you'd like to see? Would you like to see Lady Killer? Oh yeah, I think it'd be fun. I would like to see yeah, different things adapted. I mean, I've always been curious about that. And, um, Twelve Reasons went through some regular role on Did that, it? and that would make it awesome. Um, and then, indie, like, well, indie movie. It, sadly, there was this thing called Five Hundred Days of Summer that yes. came along a couple years <laughs> sure. after the book, and sort of never heard of it. Yeah, it's not very good. But, um, <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. Uh, <laughs> But I, I do like when people come up and they acknowledge, like, you did this first. Like, I did, thank you. Um, <laughs> I kind of stole it from Two for the Road, so it's all right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but once again, way too old for people to get that yes. reference. <laughs> Um, so something we do with uh, with all of our guests is we have a, a fun little segment called uh, Weird Questions with Donovan Eilert. Okay. And uh, if you'd uh, you don't like, mind? like yeah. to play, uh, we'll yeah. turn things over to Donovan Eilert for some weird questions. Okay. Do you prefer Augustus Caesar or Augustus Gloop? <laughs> The question America has been asked. Gossa Caesar. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, do you have a favorite Italian word? Facacta. Facacta? I think that's actually Yiddish, so no, wait. Okay. <laughs> They're Italian Jewish people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a word that I'm probably thinking of that's similar, but it's not coming to me now. But Fettuccine. A, a gabagool. <laughs> gabagool? Yeah, okay. gabagool. Cool. And the last question is, um, with toilet paper, do you crinkle or fold it? Uh, fold. Fold. Nice. All right. That's the classy man's wife. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Everybody knows now. The internet knows that. So, yeah, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much. That's been, that that. been weird questions with uh, Donovan Eilert. And then uh, we'll just uh, wrap it up with a, we do a recommendation segment where we recommend uh, comics uh, we think people should be reading. Do, do you have anything, Jamie, you've been reading that you think um, uh, is particularly good? Or, or just anything? That you yeah, I mean, I still, I, I still like my favorite ongoing is... Uh, Rachel Rising by Terry Moore. Oh, oh my god! You just made I talk about day. that yeah, so much that on book. the show. He brings it up all the time. Um, the it's how I mean. I love all the stuff he's done, but how is he consistently that terrifying and that yeah. captivating in that yeah. comic? And it also seems like a book that doesn't technically go anywhere, but you feel <laughs> like it does. I don't. Every every trade because I'm buying it in trade form that comes out. It's a new turn that I'm not yeah. expecting. So I read it's it in like, issues, and it's just like it's popcorn. Uh, yeah. I think Revival by Tim Zeeley and Mike yeah. Nolan's been like that, too. Yeah, oh, excellent. Another favorite of mine. Yeah. So. Another excellent um, Well, I'll loan you some comics. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> Harrow County by Cullen Bunn and Tyler oh, Crook. Cool. That's been right. I have, I have yet to read that. I really want to get into that, because I love Cullen Bunn stuff. Yeah. And, and, and the book I'm going to go buy tomorrow, uh, I'm gonna, Jonathan Case has copies in the New Deal. Yeah. Yes. Dark Horse graphic novel, which I've been dying to read. Yeah, so. you great. We love Jonathan Case. Very cool. Uh, Gregoni, you got anything? Um, well, as listeners of the podcast will know, I really enjoy Godzilla. Um, 
so currently there is an ongoing series called Godzilla in Hell. Um, it's by the it's by the same guy who did uh, Godzilla Half Century War, which was one of my favorite comics of last year, uh, one of my favorite comics of all time. And Godzilla in Hell is just Godzilla going through the different layers of hell, fighting you know greed and what would be Godzilla's lust and things like that. It's a really fun comic. It's super beautiful. Godzilla is the main character, so you're basically just following a radioactive lizard through the layers of hell. If that sounds appealing to you, you should check it out. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> um, the the book I I don't know if I recommended it on here before, but um, I've really been enjoying the. Um, uh, Jeff Johns, Gary Frank, Batman Earth One mm. stuff. Uh, I think it's a really interesting take on the Batman origin story and then continuing story. And I love Gary Frank's art. Uh, just the the detail and it's just beautiful to look at. And an interesting take on the, like the the real real world superhero mm-hmm. idea, yeah. where like trying to figure out like well, how would Batman actually operate? In right. Like yeah. I love the very first pages of that where he's chasing after the guy and he goes to use the grappling gun and just blows up in his hand. <laughs> yeah. Like I've never seen yeah. anything like that. That's a cool take on him. Or, and being able to see Batman's eyes under the mask yeah. instead of just the white um, slits is kind of a cool design as well. So yeah, check it. There's two volumes of that. Um, it's a it's a cool take on Batman. Donovan? Yeah, I would like to recommend Delia Dirk and the Turkish Lieutenant by that's Tony Cliff. Too, yeah. yeah, isn't that that's all I love. Um, basically, it is this uh, over-the-top ad- um, adventurer who is this this woman who's mastered like 37 sword fighting techniques and archery <laughs> and like horseback riding and all these great things and um, she's been imprisoned in the, the Turkish Royal Guard and this, this Turkish Lieutenant is interrogating her and then she escapes and takes him along with her. <laughs> and all he wants to do is stay at home and drink tea. And like he likes an orderly life, and they go on this adventure together, and you get to see the progression of him um, and all the stages of like not wanting to be there and having too much fun, and then not knowing what to do with that, and I mean the the whole thing. And it's really it's a beautiful book. It's really fun. It's a quick read. I mean, I read it in like a sitting and just had a lot of fun. So, Deal Leader and the Turkish Lieutenant by Tony Cliff. Cool. So yeah, go and uh, check all those comics out. Um, So I think that's going to do it for this episode of Panel on Panels. We want to thank Jamie S. Rich for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And uh, do you have an online presence you can plug, Twitter and stuff? Yeah, my actual website is confessions123.com. So it's confessions numeral 123. Um, And then I'm on Twitter as Jamie S. Rich, which is J-A-M-I-E-E-S-R-I-C-H because I couldn't get my actual name. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I should have done like a longer E S S S or something, but yeah. <laughs> um, and that, yeah, and so I'm on Twitter there. Cool. cool. And uh, of course, you can find us on Twitter. We're at Panel on Panels. Um, we're also on Facebook as Panel on Panels, Instagram, Pinterest, uh, all the social medias. Look for Panel on Panels. Uh, we're out there. We're not about. We're not a podcast about wood panels. And of it's course, uh, <laughs> we'd appreciate it if you rate and review us on iTunes. Um, I think that's going to do it for this episode. I've been John Campbell. I am currently Mike Gergoni. And I will always be Donovan Eilert. Keep reading comics, everybody.